Hey, Chris Myers here to welcome you to the Cinema Shame Podcast. Here comes another Shame Down episode with a vengeance. 1973 demands justice, and 1973 is going to get it by any means necessary. James and Alan take a look at some crime classics. The Outfit, Serpico, Big Guns, Cops and Robbers, The Doll Squad, and my personal favorite of the bunch, which James had never seen before, Shura Yukihime. Surena, Shinjiranai. For those who've been ghosting the Duolingo Owl lately, that's Lady Snowblood. I know, I can't believe it. And just like Sally Brown in a Peanuts special, 1973 is owed restitution! Hell hath no fury like a woman's scorn, eh, Charlie Brown? Anyway, time for me to lose my grudge before things get too blue. And not the sad kind of blue, if you catch my drift. Enjoy this one after dark. It's easier to hide your sins that way. Welcome to the Cinema Shame 1973 Shame Down. This is another episode in which we watch a whole bunch of movies we haven't seen before, all because they came out in 1973. We have some criteria, we sometimes follow it, we sometimes don't. I'm James, and that's Alan. Hi. And if you want to know anything good about 1973, we can't help you. It was before... We were around, and we have no first-hand information. And we have no way to look anything up. We have no way to look anything up. Although, I did I did look something up, because I couldn't not say something about 1973 to really paint that picture. Uh, the top three television shows in 1973? Any guess? Uh, was Bonanza one of them? That That's a terrible guess. The top three shows in 1973, All in the Family, The Waltons, and Sanford and Son. Favorite foods in 1973 that I have listed here. Obviously, this is very scientific study. Uh, Jello salad is on the list. Quiche, deviled eggs, cheese balls, spam, tab, and hamburger helper. If that doesn't give you 1973 color, <laughs> there's not much else. See, I was considered a fussy eater, but I just spent the first five years of my life in the worst decade for food ever, so I feel like it was unfair for people to say that about me. Secretary won the 1973 Triple Crown. Popular toys were Shrinky Dinks, the Evil Knievel stunt cycle, the fun dune buggy, which was a ride-on car that went all the way up to two miles an hour. Woohoo! Mm-hmm. Walkie talkies apparently were big in seventy three. They're big every year. And hoppity hops. I had hoppity hops. Did you still have hoppity hops? I, I didn't have anything that involved going up or down. You didn't have any stimulation of any kind. You had a rock. I was given a block of ice. That was what I was given. No, you were just given a boulder that you could sit on. No, our family wasn't rich enough to have mm-hmm. boulders. Highest grossing movie of nineteen seventy three was. Mm. I'm bad at, I'm bad at uh, The Godfather? No, that'd be two. That would be 71 or 72. I'm not sure then. The Exorcist. The Exorcist, okay. The Exorcist. Followed by The Sting. The, which is the much better of the two, movie of the two. <laughs> I mean, we'll probably talk about that in just a second. I don't have any really, I don't have any other good facts, so I guess we can go right into our top five movies of 1973 we always like to do this before we jump into our picks so you have an idea of our personal tastes where we're coming from and the sort of weirdness that we come up with for our favorite movies i'll let alan go first with this one because i want to know too okay so my my number five is coffee Because, like any, you know, card-carrying member of the exploitation genre, I am a huge Pam Greer fan. And I would argue that if you want the most Pam Greer movie, then Coffee is definitely the one to watch, especially of her early films. I I would say if if you've never seen a Pam Greer movie in your life, watch Jackie Brown. But if you want to see, like, the most Pam Greer movie, 
watch coffee. This is the end of your rotten life, you motherfucking dope pusher. My number four movie is The Wicker Man, because, uh, I mean, I as I've made very clear, I'm a very big fan of British horror, and that probably is the best British horror movie ever made. It's definitely one that hits you every time you see it, and, uh, I mean, Ingrid Pitt, I mean, that's another bonus. I humbly entreat thee for the soul of this thy servant, Neil Howie. Uh, number three is going to be a controversial one with the uh, other person on the side of the Skype call because he mentioned it in the uh, in our Shamley's episode as a movie that he uh, he liked the actress but he didn't like the movie but I like the actress and I like the movie and that's Thriller A Cruel Picture which uh, I, I I can I can appreciate why someone would watch it and not be on its wavelength but I just like the fact that it is essentially this weird melding of a pure, like, hardcore, literally hardcore, because there are hardcore sex scenes in some cuts of it, uh, like, exploitation revenge film, with this also mix of, like, Scandinavian art house sensibility. To me, there's no other film like it, and it's a genre that I love. It's definitely my holy grail of posters. I have still yet to find a, a, a really good, affordable thriller, a cruel picture poster, but I'm always on the search for it. Uh, my second is The Last of Sheila, which is my favorite murder mystery movie of all time. Whenever I've talked about like why I don't fear spoilers, it's because my favorite murder mystery literally tells you who the murderer is in in the first 10 minutes if you're paying attention but the fun of it is seeing how it actually ends up playing out the last time i played a game was charades at my house a year ago the night sheila was killed as a matter of fact everyone here was was there except lee you were homesick in santa barbara you said uh, no, I was homesick of Santa Barbara, I said. Uh, and then my number one movie, as a huge Vincent Price fan, I gotta go with Theater of Blood, which I think is his best movie and his best performance. Hello, I'm Butch. Hey, dishy, dishy hair. <laughs> Can't wait to get my hands on it. Who's this great big beautiful thing with you? Is he yours? We almost had some overlaps, but I didn't pick them. I might... It might seem obvious. I had a solid eight or nine movies that I had trouble paring down. I, I cut a lot for my list, too. This was definitely one of the hardest lists to create for a top five. Absolutely. The, the cutoff yeah. for five was a bloodbath. Yeah. And that's why it's interesting that for my number five, I picked Disney's Robin Hood. <laughs> Directed by Wolfgang Reitherman. It was always my favorite Disney animated film as a kid. I watched it far more than any other. And uh, I hadn't watched it in many years before my daughters were born. And I still knew every line somehow after 20 years, whatever it was, not watching it. And uh, I still loved all the characters just as much as I did as a kid. So I couldn't not put Robin Hood here. The most surprising thing about that movie is how many people I have heard describe it as the film responsible for their sexual awakening. That explains the furry phenomenon a lot. And pretty much, I think we can blame it all on sexy, foxy Robin Hood in uh, in this movie. It's very curious you mention that because <laughs> my daughter made an offhand, the older one, the teenage daughter, made an offhand comment. Yeah about finding the fox in Zootopia hot. <laughs> you it's her Robin Hood. <laughs> it's, a, it's her Robin Hood. At number four, I have Paper Moon from Peter Bogdanovich. Daddy, can't we go now? I want to get to church and pray for Mama. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure we can, honey. Daddy was just fixing to leave. This here is my little girl. It's just the two of us now. My mama's gone to the Lord. Oh, so is poor Mr. Bates, honey. I hadn't seen that movie until just a few years ago. And I... Did I write something for the Cinema Shame website about it? It's possible. Don't go looking for it. That's far too much effort to find out. I didn't actually write something about Paper Moon. Just know that 
I was smitten with the way that film looks, the yeah. high contrast black and white that he uses to, to shoot that that scene, uh, the way it works with the particular setting that he's using. I think it's a, just a gorgeous looking film. Absolutely. And uh, the performances, top to bottom in that cast, were pitch perfect for that adaptation, for what Peter Bogdanovich wanted out of it. I just thought it was a fantastic film. And it may have been higher if it was a movie I'd seen earlier in life and had it had a little chance to work up. Another curious coincidence in, is that my number three is a movie that I also set out to find a perfect poster for. I have succeeded, though, where you have not. <laughs> There's far less demand for a Slither poster. <laughs> Is that the Sally Kellerman, James Caan movie? It is. Okay. It is. I have had opportunities to buy that poster, but I decided to save my $20. <laughs> yeah, I think I paid 12 $12 perhaps at auction. Um, it, is, it is an aimless, directionless, aspirationless <laughs> road trip comedy drama about buffoons who are just trying to inherit money in an RV. It, it is James Caan, it, it probably his weirdest feels reductionist, but he's playing sort of a wacky character. But he does so in only in a, in a way that is very beholden to James Caan in bravado. Like he he yeah. truly believes that he's the smartest man in the world. Yeah, and I think that's why that movie hits so well with me is because it's uh, James Caan playing off Sally Kellerman, who's fantastic, and Peter Boyle. And this won't be our last Sally Kellerman reference. Spoiler. Oh, interesting. Number two. This is where things don't get interesting. I have The Sting, directed by George <laughs> Royhill. <laughs> it's one of the movies I can watch at any time, any place, anywhere, and yep. just enjoy it like I've never seen it before. Absolutely. Your boss is quite a card player, Mr. Kelly. How does he do it? He cheats. Well, in that case, I'll keep my money and we'll just have another game. And my number one film from 1973 is The Long Goodbye, directed by Robert Altman. Curry brand cat food. Hey, it happens to be the only kind of food. Please. Yeah, Curry brand. C O U R. Oh, oh, we're all of that. Curry Why brand. Don't you get this, mister. All this shit is the same anyway. Oh, yeah. You don't happen to have a cat by any chance. What do I need a cat for? I got a girl. It is my favorite Robert Altman movie, and I am a Robert Altman fan, apologist, aficionado. Uh, even his disasters I find interesting. <laughs> he's got a few of them. Oh, he's got a lot of them, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, admittedly so. This one is another... I might use Pitch Perfect a few too many times tonight, but this one is exactly where the film noir genre needed to be in 1973. It needed to be knowing. It needed to have a Marlowe that was perhaps a little bit more culturally wise, a little less stodgy, and there's no better 1970s Robert Marlowe, Philip Marlowe, than Elliot Gould. I mean... It, it's the intersection of one of my favorite directors and one of my favorite actors in a genre that I adore. And the, the neo-noir update is funny and at times kind of thrilling. The, the way that he plays with the genre of the detective story is fascinating to me. And I will, it's another, again, it's a, it's a movie that I can put on and, just marvel at how the pieces came together and how they work so well. Uh, yeah, no, I agree. I think it's a it's one of Altman's best movies. But the, my takeaway is always like the first thing I always think of when I think of that movie is the score 
which is uh, John Williams, and basically just Robert Altman deciding that everywhere he goes, he's going to hear the same song, but it's a different version of that song. Like, I think that was just a, like such a great original idea. And I remember, like, I think I first watched this movie when I was like sixteen or seventeen years old, and that just completely blew me away. Was that aspect of it, but also talking about sort of like the uh, people having their sexual awakening with Robin Hood. Like, I wish I had a dime for every uh, like woman I know who think this era of Elliot Gould is one of the sexiest film stars of all time. Which I always think is hilarious because at that time, like the studio has like considered this the era of the uglies, and Elliot Gould was like one of those guys who like wasn't a classical leading man. And now, like you ask like women in in their forties who grew up with that, and they're like, "Oh yeah, no, he was the hottest man on earth." <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was crazy because we were. You look back, and Donald Sutherland and Elliot Gould were sex symbols. And, and and we're going to be talking about a Donald Sutherland movie pretty soon. And like, it's a case where, yeah, no, I totally buy him as a sex symbol because <laughs> that's one of the sexiest scenes in film history. I've, I just watched. <laughs> and this brings us to our first category: the shared shame. We take a look at the list and pick the one that fits. Uh, from both of ours, the one we haven't seen, the one we should have seen, and today. That movie was Don't Look Now, directed by Nicholas Rogue, starring Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie. I've seen your little girl, and she was laughing. Yes, my sister's psychic. She wants you to know. I've seen her. And she wants you to know that she's happy. Christine. John, do you hear what I say? It was Christine. My daughter is dead, Laura. She does not come peeping with messages back from behind the grave. Yes. Christine is dead. Yes. She is dead. Yes. Dead, 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 dead. (laughs) What is it? We picked this movie for a couple reasons. Uh, not all of them had to do with just its place on the letterbox list of most watched movies. It is also infamous and famous for a few notable reasons. And I don't think there's anyone better to talk about that (laughs) than with my (laughs) co-host. I had seen the most famous scene from this movie before we watched it for this. But that was the only scene I had seen. I I just basically had watched it because it was so infamous. Well, you had to know. You had to know. For for people who, who aren't aware, like when this movie came out, there was very serious controversy about whether or not in this sex scene between Julie Christie and Donald Sutherland, whether they were actually having sex on screen. Because the film, like in the film, it feels visceral and powerful in a way that you really do not see outside of actual pornography. But having 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 like watched it in the context of the film, yes, no, it's it's like any other sex scene. They're faking it. It's not they're not really having sex. But the reason why it feels like that is because and I actually like I actually ended up tearing up watching it in the context of the movie because it's probably one of the best examples of just two people who love each other sharing an intimate moment together and then just going on about their day because it's intercut like the, between them having sex it's intercut with them getting ready for dinner afterwards and i think it's that combo that makes it like feel intimate in a way you really do not see in most stylized sex scenes it was you said it was visceral it it, it resonated in ways beyond the actual fetishization of the yeah. scene itself because they're emotionally estranged at this point they're they're i mean we'll have to roll back and describe this yeah. the, the movie itself but they're grieving parents who have not had physical contact they have been em- emotionally separated because of the loss of their child this is the first time that they've come together in, I mean, the movie suggests years 
that they've been unable to be intimate with each other. And they're in a new city and they're starting to find themselves again. So this, this sex scene is uh, cathartic. Uh, I mean, I can see why people were shocked by it in the moment, but it is not exploitative in any way. Yeah. There, there's a primal reaction to it because it is so emotionally charged. Like, to me, like if I were to choose one sex scene to like whenever, whenever every twenty minutes on the internet, someone is going to like talk about how sex scenes don't need to be in movies, and this is why, blah blah blah. To me, like my three word answer would be "Don't look now," because I think this movie is a different movie without that scene, and it's a less good movie without that scene and i think like i mean it's a great movie overall in the end like i think this was like as good as it reputation suggests but i feel like that scene is is singular and uh i really don't understand anyone who could watch it and go oh yeah no i didn't need to see that that didn't need to be in there well anyone who says that hasn't allowed themselves to be invested in these characters and i think in in our current cultural landscape it's very easy to disassociate we're in we're in the world of content and content is just consumed if you're not giving this movie its due attention and you're not sitting down with it and understanding where they are in their lives at this moment you're not going to give it the same respect you, you you're just you're just not and i think that's true for any of the great sex scenes in cinema is that you need context and if you're not invested in the story it's not going to resonate and then you're automatically whether you're consciously doing it or not relegating it to the realm of exploitation and i want to be clear we we are not ever going to deny (laughs) the value of exploitation on this podcast i mean in in our 2003 episode i literally picked a softcore porn movie as my favorite watch of that new watch of that year so (laughs) yes and uh I, I spent quite a few hours with pinky violence movies for this podcast. I didn't ultimately pick them because I went with a, a little classier version. But the, the fact remains that I think there is a time and place for exploitation. There is reason that it exists. And there is also a reason that a sex scene, or specifically a love scene yeah. in a movie like this, can be a fulcrum around which the story is told. And without it, we don't we don't have a sense that these characters were ever really connected. We have distance. This is where the the grief and the passion they have for each other converges. But let's roll it back yeah. to the beginning. So Don't Look Now is a story about Laura and John, played by Julie Christie and Donald Sutherland, who are grieved by the loss of their daughter who she, she drowns at their home. I don't remember where they are. It's not relevant. Yeah. They're um, at a cabin and she drowns in a lake that's near, yeah. near the cabin. And they attempt to start over by picking up and going to Venice. He is restoring an old church. And what is she, I don't remember. I, I'm missing the part where she, what she's doing. No, she's just, she's just there with him. Being there. Yeah, she's just yeah. being there with him. Like she's like just sort of his plus one. Yeah, yeah. she doesn't have an official role. And the the setting itself plays a huge oh, role. Oh, yeah. This, this, this movie made me never want to go to Venice, ever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, go, I'm going to Venice in a couple months. <laughs> <laughs> you watched the wrong movie before <laughs> taking those lines. There are a lot of movies set in Venice. This was not one that was like <laughs> encouraging uh, th- this particular trip. But what it does is create the visual motif uh, of the river and yeah. the water in Venice recalling their trauma. They can't escape it because yeah. they're constantly still surrounded by water that reminds them of their loss. Yeah. The, the setting itself, it's a cliche to say that the setting is a character, but the setting is the continued oppression of these characters. It is the horrific element that sets the tone for the entire movie. And although this is lumped into the horror film category. I don't think I can call it 
horror. <laughs> I, I don't I, I I would disagree there. Like to me, it very much played like a horror movie. But I think it's an example where I think it maybe hit me harder. And I'm sure you like I'm sure you knew the ending too. But because I knew the ending and I knew it was coming, it gave it gave the film to me like a very much a sense of dread that like to me really like I really only feel with a certain kind of horror movie. Like uh, to me, it was we, we uh, recently in an episode we talked about the descent. And I, I, I talk about how that's a movie that terrified me before they even got to the actual quote unquote scary parts. And I think that's the way I sort of felt about Don't Look Now is both the, uh, like the setting. Most films uh, shot in Venice are very romanticized, whereas this is almost the complete opposite, where it's made to look like a, like a place you actually don't want to go. And, and I think that playing along with the fact that I always knew what the final end game of the movie was. It robbed all hope from the movie. And once I realized like that specific moment, there's a specific shot of uh, Julie Christie uh, on a boat in like black. And once I realized like what that symbolized and what that meant and what was coming after that, like I was just, yeah, I was gone. <laughs> See, I didn't, I didn't feel like it was, I mean, it's a fine line, right? So I felt it almost had more in common with the 70s paranoia thrillers in many ways than it does horror movies. I know, to me, it plays like a Tone Town Giallo. Yeah, I, I got, yeah, yeah, I got those those vibes too. Uh, I mean, it, it, Rogue certainly was aware of the the Giallo or the, the burgeoning Giallo genre yeah. at that point and, and probably used some visual cues the way he stages some of the i mean they're not we're not staging kills but we are yeah. staging uh what the movie is is using in lieu of yeah. like a death scene horror movie <laughs> is where truly mm-hmm. terrible stuff happens to good people who don't deserve it and mm-hmm. I think that's why I would classify Don't Look Now as a horror movie is because these characters do not deserve what happens to them right from the beginning, right to the end. And I think that's what, to me, why it plays like like like, like a truly horror movie is because, yeah, no, it, like to me, the most horrific moment isn't actually the end. It's at the beginning. And it's a shot of him coming out of the water with his daughter in his arms. Mm-hmm. And that is one of the most powerful things I've ever seen. While you're watching it, could you fit together the pieces? Did the pieces fit as you're watching it? Or is this a movie that doesn't come together for you until the final? I think because I knew the ending and I knew like the twist, I basically never felt like, oh, I have no idea what's going on. I could always figure out like, okay, this is where, this is what this Mm -hmm. is leading to. And this is what this is leading to. And it all eventually led there. And to me, that's why like whenever people like bellyache about spoilers, to me, this is a perfect example because if anything, my knowing what happened didn't ruin when it happened. It made it more powerful when it happened because all this time I'm like, okay, I know this is going to happen. I know this is going to happen. I know this is going to happen. And then when it happens, instead of feeling relief, it's like, holy fuck, that happened. <laughs> I had this. I had similar a similar reaction, but I did. So I was thinking about this in terms of I knew the ending, and if I didn't know the ending i'm not sure i could have put the pieces together as the movie unfolded i would have seen it as disassociated elements of a film that was that didn't come together at the end because there's no way to as you're watching it, it for the first time if you go in fresh without knowing what ultimately this movie is taking you down what where it's taking you i'm not sure i give it the credibility That it deserves. Now, that's not to say you can't enjoy it on a first-time watch without knowing anything. Put the pieces together. Have that aha moment at the end. Think, okay, I need to go back and watch that again to see how it all fits together. But you need to have that moment where you like, where you're, where you value the movie enough to want to go back. So in that way, I thought it was interesting because it was one of the rare examples that I could specifically point to and say, stuff your spoiler shit because I'm tired of the don't tell me, don't tell me culture that's out there. That's like, how dare you talk about a movie that I could go see if I wanted to. I mean, there are instances where I could probably come up with a counter argument, but I still believe that that movie should hold up with the spoilers. I made this argument before. I don't need to do this again. 
My point is that I valued my experience more knowing what was going to happen on this first watch. Because if I if I watch this for the first time, actually, I have some, some experience because my wife tuned in, didn't know anything about the movie, was watching through the last half, semi-sorta, like she does. She reads and, and picks things up, and she's like, what the fuck just happened? That didn't make any sense. I'm like, you know what? I can see why you'd say that. I would also argue that the reason why it feels disassociated is because it's a film about trauma. It's very specifically about trauma and grief. And I think a person who is experiencing that will have moments that just feel off and feel like right. they're not part of what's happening. Julie Christie's character especially, sometimes she was inconsistent, but it made sense in a way totally in keeping with what had happened to her. I want to talk about a little bit about how the film looks, because you mentioned that Venice is normally filmed with a sort of romantic lens, and this is anything but. So the cinematography was done by Anthony Richmond, who worked with uh, Nicholas Rogue on Walkabout and The Man Who Fell to Earth. And I, I got interested in Anthony Richmond because I didn't know his name, but I thought this movie was visually stunning and very effective in the way that it told its story. One of the major components, of course, was the way it looks. But he never really duplicated his work with Nicholas Rogue anywhere else. He filmed Ravenous, which is one of the few examples I could, I could find on his filmography that was like he was able to, to pick this up later. But it's weird to me that this guy had this string of films with Nicholas Rogue and then went off eventually to make First Kid and Dumb and Dumber when Harry met Lloyd. You have to remember is that Rogue started out as a cinematographer. The best movie he shot was uh, Roger Corman's Mask of the Red Death, which is easily Roger Corman's best-looking movie. I think. Like, I always talk about that movie. Like, if that movie was made by uh, Igmar Bergman, it would be talked about as one of the great masterpieces of the 1960s instead of as a Roger Corman movie. It is one of the great yeah. masterpieces of the 1960s. But, but, but we know that, but it would, it would be held to that standard by everyone. But right. but like I think because then you have a director with such a strong sense of like the camera and visual style that I'm sure I'm sure that you know the the other the, the other cinematographer was an equal partner but he is essentially working with someone who can tell him what to do and the other guy's going to know it'll be better if I do it his way instead of my way even so, you'd think that he would have convinced someone yeah. <laughs> to give him a high-profile gig somewhere that he could have stumbled into some leader success. Yeah. But they're just the the resume. Just there's a couple solid films, yeah. but nothing that ever approaches this that I noticed. In terms of the actual visuals, that is where it feels most like a giallo, but it's a muted giallo. They're not wearing the bright, colorful, right. stylish clothes. It's very much a film that looks like it was made in 1972. Or like I'm sure I'm assuming it was made that year before it was released, and it, it very much has that, yeah. that sense of style. But it, in terms of like like that dissociation, I think that maybe that's why it didn't bother me. Is because I've seen so many Jalo films in the past couple of years. The idea of watching a movie like this that ultimately doesn't make sense doesn't even bother me. Like to me, that's part of the fun, I indulging in the atmosphere. I think the one difference though is that in those cases of those other films, no matter how graphic and gross they are, ultimately it is sort of a sexy, fashionable vibe. Whereas in this case, it's, it's Julie Christie is always going to be fashionable despite the fact that she's Julie Christie, but it's very muted, but it, it's also very powerful. And I think the thing that like talking about Venice like the thing that disturbed me the most beyond like some of the shots of the streets and the water and the stuff like that imagine wanting to cross the street and you have to basically walk a full block you know just to get a bridge it's not like you even have the option of jaywalking <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah I'll let you know how it goes <laughs> what are you reading I was just trying to find the answer to a question Christine was asking me the world's round, why is a frozen pond flat? Huh. That's a good question. All right, next on our agenda is our highest unseen movie on Letterboxd slash IMDb. I called an audible on mine. Because my highest unseen on Letterbox was Fantastic Planet. <laughs> I watched Fantastic Planet. I don't want to talk about Fantastic Planet. 
he literally he literally uh dm'd me while he was watching it and said have you seen this movie it's like yes i have <laughs> i'll just mention briefly that i was not on anything and that was my mistake that was my bad i probably should have prepared for that viewing but I've had the the Criterion disc with all intents of, all intentions of watching it, and and I, I did so. I no longer own the Criterion disc of Fantastic <laughs> Planet. I made sure to watch through all the extras, so I got my entire fill, and I could just remove it from the shelf with good conscience. So, it, I watched my other highest unseen i just want i just want to interrupt and say that yes that that uh when i watched a movie i really didn't like that was my highest on watch i just flat out talked about it i didn't uh i didn't pull this like oh i didn't like it so i'm not going to include it thing (laughs) i don't even know what to talk about all right There were some ideas. I was like, that's interesting. I could see how that was adopted by other filmmakers that come along in the future. Science fiction filmmakers definitely watched this and digested its core. But it was just so slow. (laughs) And there were some interesting visuals. I know George Lucas pretty much lifted some of the creatures from Fantastic Planet and drop them into the Star Wars universe. Yeah, absolutely. So I appreciated seeing where some of these things came from. Hooray for Fantastic Planet. I'm not going to watch it again. (laughs) I I put it on my sheet here, my notes, and put a big line (laughs) through it. I did so so that I could talk about another movie and add it to my list because... I have more interesting things to say about it. Besides, I wasn't high enough. (laughs) So I just shuffled down and watched Lady Snowblood, directed by Toshia Fujita. I have talked about this briefly on our Shamely Awards episode because Meiko Kaji won Best Actress for her performance in Lady Snowblood. It's celebrated as a pulp classic and one of the most well-regarded examples of Japanese exploitation cinema. But after watching it... I firmly believe the film's value goes way beyond the visceral thrill of just watching the bad guys get sliced in half. I mean, there, there's something to it that's like a poem. It, it's this stoic lead character that, that also in many ways parallels the, the more mute heroes of our American Westerns. And the Fujita focus focuses heavily on the the beauty of the of nature of just the the setting and he used that to uh, foreground the action especially against blank snowscapes especially with blood spattered all across blank snowscapes and i mean is there a, a better contrast than blood and snow in cinema semen and black velvet <laughs> Oh, yes. Well, all right. That's a different genre. That's not this one. You know, Japanese exploitation cinema isn't isn't shy about uh, nudity or body counts or comical amounts of bloodletting. Uh, as I said, I watched a whole bunch of the pinky violence movies uh, that, I hadn't, that I hadn't seen for this episode. But this particular movie showcased a far greater concern for aesthetic uh, and art than really anything made in the U.S. at this time. I mean, if you consider the the genre films that that the U.S. was churning out, uh, I mean, the Revenge-O-Matics, what what style did any of those have that that stood out from another one? And that's really what this story is, is is a Japanese (laughs) Revenge-O-Matic. Well, it's interesting kind of to, like, contrast the thriller and just sort of, because to me it's it's almost, because it's, 
it's almost the opposite because thriller it's so low key and turned down like it's almost like an anti action action movie whereas mm-hmm. in the case you have like sort of the opposite where it's like turned up to 10 in an era where 3 was the standard just to to rewind for just a second we're talking about the revenge romantic genre so that's that's strictly that that type of film that's bad things happen the good guy gets pissed and exacts revenge about everyone that has wronged him and his family. There are really good revenge matic There are really trashy revenge matic You can see them, the 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 evolution of the revenge matic in the Death Wish yeah. series. It starts out as you know something that's reasonable, and then it just evolves into just straight trash. Yeah. There's a there's a wide range of these things. I think I watched. F- five or six <laughs> movies that would qualify for this particular episode. <laughs> so this story is about, um, well, it's, I guess it's, it's a little more complicated than that because this goes through generations. Uh, a woman named Yuki, her family is wiped out due to uh, the evil doing of a band of shysters, really. They're, they're in it for the money. She exacts revenge by getting pregnant in prison so that she can give birth to an assassin who will go on the killing spree and avenge <laughs> and avenge the death of her family as you do <laughs> it uh it's it's less complicated than the movie somehow <laughs> explaining it was very convoluted um so with with that backstory, the young assassin trains her entire life uh, to go forth and kill the four bandits who were responsible for the deaths of her family. The kills are really satisfying. The bad guys are super bad, so when they get it, it's just a, you know, it's got that wonderful catharsis you get when the bad guys get what's coming to them, when, especially when they're really bad. What I was most interested in going into this was knowing that it tarantino lifted this as inspiration for a kill bill so i wanted to know like what what kind of lifting are we talking about here and i i can i can definitely say now that he did a control c and added more dialogue yeah (laughs) Uh, i mean there are differences i'm i'm oversimplifying but uh this is my preferred version of that story uh I think some of it is the, just the when it was filmed um, versus something that is newer and glossier. Because even though this looks tremendous and is you know it doesn't look like we're, we're certainly talking about a grindhouse picture yeah. here. N- newer um, in this context, meaning a movie that's only twenty years old. Only <laughs> it came out yesterday. Uh, my point is that I have more affection for yeah. Movies that came out in the seventies, generally speaking, than I did movies that I saw twenty years. I was ago. just like, even just today, I was thinking about like, you know, like if I became a director and like I, I like what kind of movie would I make? And I just a part of me was like, I wouldn't like any movie that I make because I would be making it now. And in reality, I want to make a movie in 1969 or 1973. Like I don't want yeah. to make a movie. I don't want to make a modern day movie. <laughs> We want to do exploitation probably yeah. in the manner of the holdovers, yeah. which is just selling itself as a movie made in 1971, yeah. I think is what it uses in the title card yeah. specifically. Uh, and yeah, I can get behind that. Uh, I've always been more interested in, especially movies that are contemporary movies that are uh, period pieces made to look like they were done in the style of that era. I think that's just a, a fascinating exercise in filmmaking. But, but even then, in my head, if I were to make my dream movie, it would probably be a, a Russ Meyer beach musical. And <laughs> and the pro- the only problem is it could never be made because they don't even make the kind of film that Russ Meyer used to make Russ Meyer movies. So no mm-hmm. matter what you did, it would never look right. It would never look like Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. And to me, that's that's what every movie should look like. Every movie should look like Beyond the Valley of the Dogs. <laughs> this is my happening, and it freaks me out. Uh, I was I was curious about this director because I didn't know him by name, but it turns out I'd seen a few of his movies before. I've seen the Stray Rock Cat series. It, it's been a while. 
I don't remember anything approaching this level of sophistication. Uh, in fact, I remember he he did Wild Jumbo, which is the second film in that series, and that's just a, a silly thing about aimless hangout and rebellious youths, and, yeah. and I, it was not remarkable in, in any it, did, real... it didn't rise to slither level. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not. So if this is his only masterpiece, it, it's hey, it's, it's worth <laughs> at least he's got one. Just, you know, he's got he's got one, and then he's got some. I went down the list a few, and uh, he's certainly operating in a lascivious genre uh, mm-hmm. further down the list of notable projects. A, a lot of pinky things yeah. uh, down at the bottom of that. Well, uh, I, mine, mine has a lot less bloodshed in it. Uh, and that I watched uh, Francois Truffaut's Day for Night. Uh, which I thought was like a really entertaining behind the scenes look at international filmmaking in the seventies, but I I found like that it offered more sort of fun insights into like the weird things movie makers have to do to get shots we just take for granted. Like to me, like two of the good examples in this movie is like the them having to use like a a fake candle in order to get the right lighting for a shot. Like you, you can't just use a real candle, like it wouldn't work, but that's something you would never occur to you unless you've actually, you know, been on the set of a movie. And there's also a really great scene where like they've set up like a fake wall and a window on top of the scaffolding, just so because they need to have this scene where uh, the, that Lily like actress in the movie waves to like her family in like a window in a, like uh, across like, across this area and they don't, they don't have a building there that they can just use. So they have to fake one. And like, to me, that's an example of something you would never think about unless you actually saw it being filmed and stuff like that. Like the little sort of minutia like that, that I really like thought made this a fun movie. But I also thought it was like less successful in its depiction of its actors who Truffaut like depicts as like fragile, immoral teenagers, you know, rather than portraying them as adults with like any real depth or complexity. Uh, I personally felt a lot of affection for them, but I get the sense that that was despite his efforts rather than because of them. Uh, and this disdain really feels a bit weird given how, you know, his character, you know, he plays the director himself isn't saddled with, like, similar faults. Like, he's portrayed instead of, like, this harried father who must constantly diminish his vision because of the problems created by these troublesome children. Uh, And um, because of that, it sort of felt less like an authentic depiction of the realities of making movies as it did, like, Truffaut's own attempt to suggest of, like, you know... I could have made some really great movies. Like I made, I made some great movies, but I could have made some really great movies if I didn't have to work with these children, you know, who, who, who you know, these pretty people who have to be in these movies. And, uh, and I, I think that sort of like, as much as I enjoyed the movie, that sort of left a little sour taste in my mouth. Like I, I felt like he could have been a bit more balanced between depicting the you know the director, the crew, and the actors. I feel like he he let his biases show a little too much there. Although I will say that one of my jokes for a long time is I watched uh, a Chuck Vincent uh, movie called Student Affairs, which sold itself like based on the poster and the title was it was it looked like a Porky's ripoff. But when you actually watch the movie, it's actually about the making of a Porky's ripoff. I hadn't seen Day for Night, but I always described it as the titty comedy version of Day for Night. And now having seen the two of them, I can honestly say I actually prefer Chuck Vincent's version because, like, it, yes, it has, like, goofy TNA slapstick and, like, and in porn level performances because several of the performers are actual real life porn stars. Uh, but it still manages to feel similar in tone to Day for Night, but in a way where I felt much more affectionate about sort of the act of filmmaking and and about the people who make films rather than disparaging. And I think that may just been because like Chuck Vincent, who people people might not know him, but he was a uh, a director in the seventies uh, and eighties who sort of went back and forth between porn and. Uh, and R-rated sort of exploitation movies. Uh, But the thing that sort of set his movies apart was that he was a gay man who made, 
like films for like horny men. And but because of that, there's this weird tension in his films because they often feature a very like noticeable gay camp sensibility. But in the context of a film designed purely to, you know, show tits to dudes. And I think that's why, you know, maybe he he's a bit more weirdly affectionate because if that's if that's what you're doing for a living, you're doing it because you're loving it. He wasn't m- making money like doing this. He wasn't getting famous doing this. He was doing this because he genuinely loved being a filmmaker. Whereas with Truffaut, as, as famous as he is, as one of the, you know, great paragons of, like, film love and the ultimate cinephile, I mean, Day for Night kind of suggests that he didn't really dig making movies. No, he certainly, he comes off as just sort of a crotchety jerk <laughs> yeah. who's doing it because he's he can. Yeah. And that's I think that's part of the, uh, one of the elements that draws me to his character in the movie is that he is going through the motions uh he thinks very highly of himself and yet it's clearly something that he wishes was not the way it was or what he's doing there's a there's an underlying tension between him and the project itself yeah. throughout the whole film i think that's interesting yeah. the 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 asshole director who's who's celebrated as a genius Showing everybody again that he's, you know, I could do anything I fucking wanted and this is what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah, no, like I said, I, I definitely wouldn't say I didn't like the movie. I actually really enjoyed it. But I just I, I just felt that that was sort of like, but then again, I'm not I'm not always like a critic of like filmmakers showing their bias. Like to me, I, that is the job of the filmmaker is to basically say, you know, this is who I am. But in this case, it's sort of like, OK, that's who you are, Francis. I don't think I like you. I liked you. I, I, I liked you in Close Encounters in the Third Kind, but mm-hmm. I don't think I like you here. N'avez-vous pas fait récemment une rencontre? Have you recently had a close encounter? Une rencontre plutôt inhabituelle. A close encounter with something very unusual. Time for our most shameful shame: the movie that may not be at the top of anyone's list necessarily, but it's the movie we personally should have sat down and just fucking watched by now. For me, let's talk about Sidney Lumet, shall we? <laughs> Literally today, I posted a, uh, a tweet and a, a skeet uh, about how many times we've talked about Sidney Lumet on the show. And I, I had to bite my tongue because I knew we were going to be talking about Sidney Lumet on the show we were recording today. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we've talked about Sidney Lumet on more episodes than we have it. Some episodes we just say his name because we feel lonely and want to bring him up. And I wanted to make sure that our loyal listener got to check that bingo box. Yeah. <laughs> so I hadn't seen one of Sidney Lumet's highest profile films, Serpico. I'm an officer! I'm a police officer! Jesus, Frank, how was I supposed to recognize you? You stupid fuck. Frank, I didn't know you! You didn't know me! You fire without looking! You fire without a warning, without a fucking brain in your head. And it's a film that boasts a certain brand of cultural cachet. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's referenced in a way that sort of approaches Scarface in terms of, you know, just the, the cultural understanding of what people are talking about. Yeah. Uh, in the general appropriation of the term Serpico, as I understand it, is just a reference to any sort of diligent cop yeah an uncorruptible diligent cop who actually believes in the law and not uh that and that is the premise but i do think the meaning has gotten watered down to the point where it's just i think it just means like super super cop. it's a cop like, like, like yeah, yeah he's he's a yeah. he's a he's really excited about his job he's serpico right yeah so having sort of digested this over the you know the course of my entire existence I think I kind of expected something different than what I received with Serpico. And I mean that in a very good way, because I'm not particularly a fan of cop dramas, which is what I kind of build it as. So not even the great Sidney Lumet attached to the 
the title was like I needed to watch that movie. I felt like I had a handle on the kind of movie that it was. And, you know, maybe I'll happen across it someday and I'll just watch it. Well, that day was the day I realized that it was my most shameful shame. And I was wrong about everything I expected with this movie. It is not a cop procedural. It is not a cop drama per se. It is a character study of a hippie cop, a hippie honest cop in a system that is totally corrupt. And he is just trying to survive. And then it goes into the procedural and the the courtroom stuff, and then it sort of loses its way. But for the first 90 minutes, 80 minutes of the movie, I was smitten. I was ready to call this the best movie in 1973. And I don't mean that to shame the end of the movie. I mean that to celebrate what the movie begins. Because it is based on a true story. It's based on a real guy, a real cop. And they eventually had to get to the whole uh, trial and testimony in order for him to get out of this circumstance. But with regard to the first part of the movie, Al Pacino is, of course, Serpico. It's one of his signature roles. He is just such a sublime character. I called it a Kafka-esque labyrinth. He's a good man ostracized for not taking money, not looking the other way, not allowing bureaucracy to dictate his job. Uh, And everyone is turning against him every time he tries to take another step to uh, protect himself or change the job it's change the job he's he's met with resistance and all this time i said he's a character study because he's not a cop i mean he is a cop but he's not a cop this 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 character has nothing to do with what you expect a policeman to be he's yeah. he's bearded and he's an intellectual he he dates a ballet dancer so he reads the biography of famous famous dancers and then does some ballet moves in the precinct and of course people start talking about how gay he is and the captain won't promote him or give him jobs because he's a homosexual because he did a singular ballet move in 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 the precinct he wears overalls and strappy sandals he moves into his new apartment and buys a sheepdog that's on the street um he goes by the name paco i'm gonna confess something now i have seen superco but i saw it when i was 16 so it's been over 30 years. So I don't have like a lot of firm <laughs> memories of it. Is there a scene where like he explains why he's a cop? Because I, I, I seem to feel like that sort of like would be like, like the way you describe him, like the central tension would be like, well, why is this guy even a cop in the first place? He just wants to help people. It's, it's a 100% altruistic reason for joining the police force. And he learns immediately it's, it's set up as in, the first day on the job, he's given an envelope with cash on it so that he looks the other way and, and does what he's supposed to do. But the the character and, and the film, and this is certainly indebted to C. Lumet's perspective on filmmaking, has a sense of humor. The character has a sense of humor, and, and the movie celebrates that. He then goes about eroding the character to establish the, the paranoia and the weight that he's under as the good cop in a corrupt system. I think this might be my favorite Pacino performance now that, that we're looking at it. If you, and especially if you look at the, the run he had between 1972 and 75, when he's the, the five, the five movies he made between 72 and 75 are Godfather, Serpico, Scarecrow, Godfather two and dog day afternoon, which is unbelievable. Yeah. And I mean, you, you can stretch that out and, 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 you know, we get, Eventually, we get Yelly Al Pacino, but I like Yelly Al Pacino. I, I do too, and I think Yelly Al Pacino <laughs> get, gets a bad rap for being Yelly Al Pacino. Uh, yeah. I, I've certainly enjoyed Yelly Al Pacino performances in, in Sea of Love. I think he's quite good. And, yeah. Um, I mean, Scent of a Woman is, is sort of a cultural joke at this point, but uh, I do still enjoy the movie and his performance. He gets a little irate here as he gets a little crazier and and driven to uh, madness. But he is just so much fun here. Just as one off-the-cuff example, he's working undercover. And there's a sequence of scenes 
uh, about midway through the movie where he just walks into the precinct wearing whatever disguise he was wearing and there's no lead in there there's he's wearing like a butcher's outfit at one point it, I, i'm not even sure what it is but it looks like a a bloody yeah. smock like he's been really doing the thing that he was <laughs> supposed to, and then he walks in in a rabbi costume full beard <laughs> no explanation and he's just carrying on <laughs> conversations with the other cops in the, in the in the precinct as if there's nothing amiss and that's kind of the tone of the film until later on when it shifts but i had a lot of fun with serpico and i didn't think i was going to the lumet touch with pacino certainly i, I don't think can be understated he they the two of them had this had a I mean, I, I wish I knew more about their working relationship because they, yeah. I mean, after Serpico, they made Dog Day Afternoon together and that. Which is my favorite Pacino performance. Yes, mine too. And it's the movie, it's the movie that made me want to watch more Lumet. I believe that was probably yeah. uh, the first one where I was like, oh, that's, that's a Sidney Lumet movie. That's who Sidney Lumet is. I need to watch more by this director because it was one of those formative movies for me growing up. I watched it 16 or 17 years old and um, I picked up this. I mean, I, I'm not, I don't remember exactly the timeline when that Sidney Lumet book came out, but that's yeah. when I was like, I'm going to watch everything this guy has done. <laughs> Well, we're going to go in a much different direction. We never do that. We never Serpico. we never do that. <laughs> but I will say we have some sort of connection to Lady Snowblood because if you've listened to the 2003 episode, you will know that I am enough of a fanatic for the genre of kick-ass ladies come together to kick ass that I put Charlie's Angels full throttle in my top five for that year. So it boggles the mind that I had never actually seen the movie some people believe Aaron Spelling ripped off when he created Charlie's Angels. I don't actually believe that's true, but spiritually it may be true. And that is Ted V. Michael's The Doll Squad. Senator, uh, <clears throat> sex and security just don't mix Sabrina, when are you leaving? Well, just as soon as I round up the rest of the doll squad and you give me a phony microfilm that only an expert could decipher. I'll take care of it. I'll also arrange an island contact for you. As a huge fan of movies in which a squad of women are thrown together to save the world, Doll Squad is one of those like 70s movies that seems caught in between the 60s and the 70s. Visually, it's very similar to like the colorful, like Dean Martin, Matt Helm movies, but its visual brightness and retro aesthetic belies the fact that the film is really fucking brutal. Like, it's not like uh, Lady Snowblood, you know, guises of blood getting them cut in half, but it's like, don't like any character in this movie because there is a very good chance they will be murdered within five minutes of you seeing them. It's like, like there are literally characters who are only in the movie for 30 seconds just so they can get killed. And it's silly, but it's also much better made than I was led to expect. Like, it feels similar in style to a lot of that same era's Roger Corman Filipino shot exploitation movies. But uh, it doesn't have, like, sort of the glaring issues that, you know, highlight those productions. I think it's, I, I'm pretty sure Michaels was, like, Break Meyer, his own cinematographer. And I think that may, may be a recipe for success for exploitation filmmakers. Model actress Francine York is, like, I thought she was a really great and gorgeous lead. I think the only other thing I've, I've seen her in is some episodes of Batman 66. Uh, the movie definitely made me want to see more of her work. Uh, her co-star is Faster Pussycat Kill Kills, uh, Tura Santana, who doesn't really pop here the same way she does in, in Meyer's film. But still, it's a lot of fun to see her in something that, you know, isn't, uh, what's, what's that, uh, uh, Billy Wilder prostitute movie she's in uh, with uh, Shirley MacLaine and uh, Jack Lemmon. Irma LaDuce. Irma LaDuce. Yeah, that's, that's the other... Uh, I know there's uh, there's Faster Pussycat Kill Kill, uh, the Astro Zombies, 
Irma LaDuce and the Doll Squad are the four Turner Santana movies that I can name off the top of my <laughs> head. <laughs> Uh, in the film, York plays like Sabrina, a CIA agent who has been selected by a computer to team up with other similarly beautiful women to take down uh, Michael Ansara, who is a former agent who turned terrorist who plans to use bubonic plague to blackmail the world. Uh, the film never explains why the computer insists he must be stopped by a gang of like stacked hotties. Uh, but it's easy not care since the movie the movie moves really fast and doesn't treat its heroines with kid gloves. Uh, not in a way that seems designed to like sort of um, arouse the sadism of misogynists. More like, well, we're making like a female version of a movie we've seen with dudes a hundred times. So let's have it be as action packed and violent as those movies with those dudes. So it really felt like more like they, it felt more egalitarian than potentially misogynist than anything else. The characters never really feel real, and there's always a sense of inherent goofiness in every scene. But despite this, like its willingness to get as dark as it does, just made it feel like its own special thing rather just, than just like sort of a off the shelf exploitation movie. Uh, I, I would suggest like if you there's there's not a lot to talk about this movie. Like there's not a lot of there there. Like it's one of those ones where I think you have to see it to believe it. Like no matter what I tell you, like you have to basically watch it to have like sort of like an idea of, of what it is. Uh, I would say like if the next time Vinegar Syndrome has has a sale, pick up the Blu-ray. I, that's how I watch it. It's definitely worth it. It looks gorgeous. Uh, and I also recommend, I have the uh, the Modern Harmonics vinyl release of the soundtrack by uh, Nicholas Karras, and it's really good, too. I, I recommend picking that up as well. Once again, had the soundtrack. <laughs> Hadn't seen the movie. Hadn't seen the movie. <laughs> that's, that's, for the, that's the other slot on the bingo card. I think you can get an X with that one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is Central. Connolly here, Sabrina. What do you have to report? Situation A-OK. What the devil does that mean? You can send up your rockets again, Chief, and you won't be getting any more pigeons. You can consider it case closed. Now it's everybody's favorite category. What the what? 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 And speaking of movies that there is not much to tell. <laughs> My what the what takes a decidedly different tact than usual. Ripple band and tunics. Two ripple band and tunics as they cross the wire. It's triple band. Does anyone else know you do this? Nope. It's a secret. Good. So I wouldn't tell them if I were you. This is the movie Jeremy. Directed by Arthur Barron. Is this uh, Robbie Benson? Robbie Benson. I wrote down the description and... I overcomplicated it. So I went back to Letterbox IMDb, and this is what Letterbox said. Jeremy is learning cello at an art school in New York. At school, he spots Susan, who practices for a ballet audition, and he falls in love. That is it. That is all you need to know about Jeremy. <laughs> and he spoke in class today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I we got a Pearl Jam reference for the kids. <laughs> I included this in What the What because I really liked this movie and nothing happens. He literally is just a high school kid that falls in love and that is it. So what is What the What? What is What the What because it was so well done. It's very natural and totally awkward and probably rings more true than any other movie about teenage love or courtship that I've ever seen. There's a a particular scene uh, where he works up the courage to just to give her a simple phone call. And I immediately felt PTSD (laughs) for every time I had to pick up a landline phone and call a girl I liked and her dad picked up. (laughs) There's very little plot. It is just about teenage existence, the terror and heartache of being young, not having your life in your own control. And as a result, it's probably one of the purest love stories you can ever see. It's unencumbered by the complications of adulthood or the requirements of any sort of budgeted entertainment. It is a extraordinarily low-budget film that has 
four, five actors, maybe, that it needs to pay. Everyone else feels like an yeah. extra. You know, Robbie Benson, he's not a name that a, <laughs> that a lot of people know. Which is, it's funny, because he was huge. He was huge in the 70s. He was a big deal in the 70s. And yeah. then he is was suddenly not. I, was, I could tell you one of my mom's favorite anecdotes of all time that she used to tell was we were watching the just the two of us, not the... Uh, Olivia Newton John John Travolta movie, but the Robbie Benson George Burns movie, where Robbie Benson uh, does his like uh, you know, I think it was a TV movie, but it, or maybe I'm not sure, but but he was doing like his basically Oscar role because he was playing a a man who is in- intellectually disabled, and it starts with a scene with with these with with like him and his friends at a birthday party, and for whatever reason, as like uh, you know a ten year old watching this, I found it incredibly sad. And I just burst out into tears and I just told my mom, like, if it's this sad at the beginning, what's it going to be like at the end? And the movie ends with George Burns dying in his car. (laughs) 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 Oh, the 70s, man. That's entertainment. But I just find it, Robbie Benson has always been a figure that I've been interested in. Quite honestly, in this kind of shocked, well... It's the facts that you should know and blow your mind even more when you don't know them. So when I read today that he was the voice of Beauty of the Beast in Beauty and the Beast... I was, I was going to bring that up. That was basically the last notable thing he did, I, was, was being the, the voice of... Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't know how to process that information. <laughs> I never would have made that connection, despite how many times I've seen that film. What? It's funny because I've literally seen like uh, like footage from interviews he did during that time, and you could tell how irritated they were getting by, by getting by constantly getting like like well why did they cast you in this role? It wasn't like you know how did you get the part? It was like how did fucking Robbie Benson end up being the Beast in Beauty and the Beast? What well, it is weird. <laughs> If you watch Jeremy, yeah, do yeah. me a favor. Go out and watch Jeremy. Forget <laughs> everything you knew about Robbie Benson being the Beast, if you did indeed <laughs> know that. And then picture this guy doing that voice. In this movie, he's swallowing every word he says. He's shrinking into himself. Like, that's the character. He He's not outgoing. He's very shy. He's just an artist who likes a girl. Wall-to-wall awkwardness until they get together. And even then, even then, teenage angst about how to actually exist in a relationship. It's just it's a simple movie, a nice experience. It's a nice movie with good performances. And there's a nice new Blu-ray of it, which I haven't seen, but I hear a lot of good things about it. It looked really good. That's how I watched it. So uh, my what the what is uh, not a uh, enchanting teenage drama. It is a, a really fun horror comedy, uh, and it's one of my favorite like horror comedy subgenres, which is films about a madman who like employs increasingly novel ways to kill kill off the people who have wronged him. Mm-hmm. It's not like it's not a romantic because you you should be cheering against him because usually. Like, even though he thinks they deserved it, they don't really deserve it to the degree that they're getting it. It's it's the theater. It's theater of blood. It's theater of blood. But also, like, uh, I would like that's the other sample. But the other one of my favorites is the abominable Dr. Fives, which is which I think I always I always consider basically the first Fives movie in theater of blood to be essentially the same same yeah, movie. One is only one is only 0.5 percent better than the other one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but so the movie I watch is uh, Arnold. Until our final breath, even better after death. Arnold, darling Arnold, tender Arnold. And it's funny because it's a mo- it's a bad title for what the movie actual is. When it turns out, it came out like when Willard had just made a lot of money. So they were like, okay, one name, one person named titles are what the kids want these days. So we have to call our movie Arnold. (laughs) 
uh, and and what it and it's sort of like it's about like the the twist of this one is is that much like uh, John Kramer, aka Jigsaw, in the later Saw sequels, it's the Madman is enacting all of these like complex death traps after he is actually dead. And so that's part of the fun of the movie is figuring out how this is happening, considering that literally in the first scene, like the 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 title character is a corpse, and it set, like it sets its tone early, opening tone early with that scene because it has Stella Stevens marrying the corpse uh, of Arnold, who is stipulated in his will that she will only have access to his immense fortune for as long as she lives in the st- in the estate with his dead body. He uh, uses cassette tapes to communicate with her and his other relatives, who include uh, Ronnie McDowell uh, as his brother and his uh, sister Elsa Lanchester. Uh, and... Uh, and they they all know he has hidden most of his fortune somewhere in the house. So they're trying to search for it. And they all have like arterio ulterior motives and like different agendas that like they they thought he didn't know about. Uh, and 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 soon enough, they start dying in really bizarre ways. Uh, uh, McDowell uh, gets a suit as a gift, and he and he puts it on, and it starts immediately shrinking and suffocates him. Stevens uh, takes a shower, and it's one of those things where where she doesn't notice the walls are coming in until it squishes her flat. Uh, uh, and and eventually, we're down to the last survivor. Who we find out is in was 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 in cahoots with Arnold the whole time, and they were responsible for for setting up the the, de- the death traps while he was gone. But uh, they don't realize that he had plans for them too. So the the twist of the film is that they end up getting their own their own demise as well. It's probably the worst one of the bunch. Uh, and it's well, it's never scary, uh, and features some very problematic brown face from uh, Mash co-star Jamie Farr, who plays uh, Arnold's uh, loyal South Asian servant. Uh, I, Arnold is is very fun and entertaining. Uh, that hits all the right notes in a way that uh, director George Fennedy's only other feature, uh, Terrors at the Wax Museum, did not. So he made like he 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 directed a lot of television. He only made two movies, and he he scored fifty percent. So that's that's pretty good. That pretty good batting average. All right, moving on to the wild card, where anything goes, anything you want to talk about, and. On this occasion, I want to talk about The Outfit, directed by John Flynn, starring Robert Duvall, Joda Maker, Robert Ryan, and Karen Black. The Outfit controls business, politics, police. It affects the lives of all of us. And Robert Duvall is Earl Macklin. He's being compared to Bogart and Cagney. Joe Don Baker is Jack Cody. Together, they're one of the most powerful teams in motion picture history. This is a, another version of the revenge matic It's less less of the uh, you killed so and so. I'm going to kill everybody you know. Um, this this is a low level criminal takes on a mafia organization run by Robert Ryan to avenge the death of his brother. He comes out of prison after an unsuccessful bank robbery to find out that his brother is dead, puts the pieces together, and goes to Jodan Baker and says, basically, you want to kill some guys for me? And Jodan Baker is like, I got nothing else going on. (laughs) So, it turns into a sort of buddy revenge film with Robert Duvall and Joe Don Baker setting up this scheme to systematically dismantle Robert Ryan's entire criminal empire. I don't know if I made it sound overly complicated, because the movie does not think of itself as a complicated film. It is the simple pleasures of watching... Robert Duvall and Joe Dunn Baker exist on screen and off bad guys. There, there could be some awkward comparisons made to Heat, per se, because we have the structure of the film is such that Robert Duvall and Robert Ryan have repeated contact throughout the film as 
Robert Duvall sort of feels him out, and Robert Ryan sort of believes that he's the one coming to get him, and they're just having they're having moments. We'll say we're having moments as they feel each other out. It is face value, but what you get at face value is this group of tremendous actors. And I don't want to dismiss Karen Black here because she yeah. she doesn't get a lot to do, but she is always a welcome presence. I wish her role was a little larger. I wish she had more to do than just be the girlfriend. But it has a satisfying conclusion that's topped off with a compound raid and a big shootout that uh you know the bad guys get it in the end so we're we're duly satisfied uh with the outcome and i just had a lot of fun with it and uh it's a movie that i don't notice being mentioned all too often it's available i think it's uh, only on a warner archive dvd i'm not sure it ever made the jump to blu-ray with warner archive but um Go go seek it out. We'll see if it gets the Tarantino bump, because I know he's talked about it on his podcast. Oh, has he? I missed yeah. that one. For my wild card, I'm going with one of my all-time favorite genres, and that is the quote-unquote bad movie musical. I'm going to talk about the film that put the nail in the coffin of the roadshow format. Uh, If you're listening to this, I assume you're enough of a movie nerd that I don't have to tell you what a roadshow movie was and what the experience was like. But you might not know that in 1973, it was killed dead by Lost Horizon. I first learned about this movie because it's a movie that like really disappeared. Because you don't hear anybody talking about it, even even as someone who like loves bad movie musicals, it's not a movie that people bring up when the discussion comes up, and that that and marks the fact that I had to, it was like it took this episode for me to get to see it. See it, although I did own the uh, the Twilight Time Blu-ray, and that actually kind of screwed me up because I was convinced it was a Kino Lorber Blu-ray. So I was going over my Kino Lobor section because all of my DVDs are sorted by uh, boutique retailer. Uh, (laughs) So I was going nuts for it until finally, after maybe an hour of searching, I realized, shithead, it was a Twilight Time release. And then I found it in 30 seconds. (laughs) I fucking hate when that happens, you know? I, I first learned about it reading the Medved books. It was one of their like top 50 worst movies of all time. And it got a lot of write up in their book about flops. And they described it as a film that like, you know, deservedly lost a lot of money because it was a, even when it was made, it was like a dated, bloated, miscast disaster that had no business existing. I fucking loved Lost Horizon so much. I I I really made me happy. I couldn't completely justify giving it my uh play it again, Sam, but I absolutely just love this movie. One of the things that sort of I found really funny about it was that I haven't seen Frank Kappa's original film, but like having, you know, been a person who exists, a film nerd who existed in society, I knew what the story was, and I knew about Shangri-La, and I know about people who who don't age, and, like, I knew I knew all of that stuff, so when this movie started, like, I knew it was going, but still, five minutes of this film is straight drama, and it's about, uh, Peter Finch, Michael York, George Kennedy, Sally Kellerman, and Bobby Van. They're all like the last people, the last sort of Western people at this Asian uh, airport. Revolution is just starting. All the people who don't have to be there need to get out of there. They get on the last plane without realizing that it has been hijacked and it eventually crash lands in the snowy mountain area where like 
there's no chance they're going to get rescued. But then all of a sudden, John Gielgud uh, and his crew show up and take them to this village of Shangri-La, which is turns out to be a warm, sunny paradise in the middle of basically like Arctic weather. Uh, and, and it's hidden in a place where no one could ever find it. And then like around after the, like 45 minutes of this, we finally get our first musical performance. But even that has to have an asterisk in it because it's Olivia Hussey performing for them. But it's like, like it's one of those musical scenes that could be any movie. Like it doesn't have to be a musical to have this musical number in it. So we're, we're basically, you know, 45 to 50 minutes into this musical and there hasn't been a real musical number in it. And then about five to 10 minutes after that, Liv Ullman, of all people, shows up, and then she sings the first actual musical musical. Well, she lip syncs the first actual musical musical moment. Everything depends on where you are in the circle that never begins. Nobody knows where the circle ends. We're nearly a full hour into a two hour and 29 minute musical before we get our first real musical number. And I think that partly probably explains why it was such a failure because it just like that, that is like, that's, you can't do that. Like I remember watching, uh, uh, the return of captain invincible with Alan Arkin, which is an Australian movie, but it's a movie like all I ever heard about it was a superhero parody. And then about 25 minutes into it, there's a musical number. And that's how I found out that that movie was a musical. And even then I was like, you can't wait 25 minutes for a musical to be a musical. And then a lost horizon was like, we'll show you we'll double fucking that. (laughs) And and we won't be a musical for for basically half the runtime. That said, like the 90 minutes that follow that hour are actually, for me, they were a lot of fun. It's not the kind of musical, like if you hate musicals, you will absolutely loathe the, like the, this part of the movie. You will not enjoy a single second of it. But as someone who like specifically likes this kind of over the top, misbegotten, like over, like overdone kind of musical production, I was just in heaven uh, the entire time. Although... I have to talk about the thing that I immediately noticed that I thought was funny and I did some detective work and I was like, oh, I'm very smart for for realizing this, was that Hussey spends the entire time dressed in these long, colorful gowns that basically cover every possible inch of available skins. Like they might as well be like fancy designer burkas. For like what, what the, for the degree they're trying to hide her body. Yet despite this, she looks like she's auditioning to be in a Russ Meyer movie because she is developed in a way that just is sort of like okay, that's not the Olivia, Olivia Hussey I know from other Olivia Hussey movies. And then I just clocked it. It was like she showed up to that set visibly pregnant. And and then I looked it up, and uh, and uh, Lost Horizon hit theaters in March of se- 1973, and her first son was born in February of 1973. So she was definitely pregnant when this was shot. But the funny thing was, despite this, like it almost to me made her sexier in a bizarre way because it was like I I don't know I, I can't describe it but I, I I just thought that was really funny that I was able to pick that up and it also connects it to uh to uh day for night because there's a sort of a subplot that is abandoned eventually like it, it's basically brought up in like 30 seconds in one scene and then acknowledged in 30 seconds near the end where one of the actresses who has been basically specifically hired to be in a bikini like in a pool scene and she shows up and she has a visible baby bump so i feel like like olivia hussey like proved that like they weren't making that up that stuff does happen in, in movies all the time the, it was also one of the last films to be choreographed by hermes pan and it was the last feature film produced by by russ hunter and and it's at its best when it's like shamelessly highlights their their preference for just like completely 
over the top extravagance. Like the film's largest number, living together, growing together, was actually so long and so gay that it was cut from prints <laughs> after its roadshow release. So it's really like it was only like the the, the Twilight time blu-ray release that actually restores it so that actually version actually has the full version that played in the road show screenings but uh like not every like per, like number rises to this level of gaudy fabulousness but even the smaller scale numbers really charmed me like even a uh, a uh, bobby vance question me an answer question me an answer Ship lollipop. Admittedly, the songs by Burt Bacharach and Hal David, like it's not their top tier material, but like really only the title track was the only one that I could still like sing to you like right right now. In fact, it was one of my nominees in the Shame Lease for for best original song. But I expect it's also the kind of soundtrack where if I started watching this movie every year for the rest of my life, by maybe like the fifth year, I'd be like, I fucking love all of these songs. I think it's one of those ones where the more you watch it, the more to grow with grow in you. The problem is, is that nobody has watched it that many times, but I still feel like it's it's not a lost classic, but it's definitely... Um, it should be a much bigger cult classic than it is. It's uh, it's the kind of movie where its deficiencies actually add rather than track to the charm. And uh, the fact that it seems so out of touch from its era, I think that's the thing that really I like about it. This is one I have not seen. I am almost convinced. <laughs> On the list of the things that I will not miss, first of all is noise. On the list of the things... That I will not miss is peace and quiet. All right, this is the big category. The movie that we're definitely going to want to watch again. So I might call it the favorite. If we didn't already talk about our other favorites earlier in a required category. (laughs) So my play it again, also mentioned in the Shamley episode, is Duccio Tassari's Tony Arzenta. (laughs) <laughs> Flash big guns. Ho sbagliato tante volte ormai che lo so già. Happy birthday, young man. And may you have many, many more. Slash No Way Out, starring Alain Delon, also featuring Rosal Bonieri. Yeah. I think she she might become our next uh, Sydney Lumet. <laughs> <laughs> so this film might as well be Euro Trash John Wick. Yeah. Except Euro Trash is it's it's elevated Euro Trash John Wick. It's not lost on me that it is also the name of the assassin as the title of the film. Yeah. So the story is about a mob hitman. He wants to get out of the business, but his bosses don't think that's a good idea because he knows too much. So after he says he's done, they come up with a plot. We're gonna kill him off, blow up his car. Unfortunately for everyone involved, his wife and kid get in the car next. The car goes boom. He watches it happen. And he vows revenge on all of the bosses who have killed his dog slash wife and child. (laughs) As you do. Yeah. So we've got another version of the revenge manic This one, uh, as I mentioned on the Shanley episode... Really surprised me because I've seen a Duccio Tassari film or two in my movie watching career, and I never considered him to be much of a aesthetic talent when it comes to blocking and just the overall look of a film. And you could have convinced me that this film was made by Jean-Pierre Melville. Yeah. It could it, it would take some convincing, but it, it's in the realm of possibility that I would have I would have finally agreed that that was true. There's just something about the way he films this, the way that the camera moves reminded me of Jean-Pierre Melville, the way that the scenes were staged was very Jean-Pierre Melville. He if he is not directly channeling Melville, I don't know how it could possibly look this way or feel the way that it does. Some of this is naturally the 
connection with Alain Delon and Le Samurai because it feels like it's kind of cut from the same universe. This could be his character in Le Samurai removed a few years as entering retirement, wanting to get out, that sort of thing. I could see the connection there. But there are some spectacular action sequences thrown in here too. There's a couple of really interesting car chases. I think it's worth mentioning that there's a type of Euro crime Euro trash genre that I would say is an interesting car chase. And it's just because it's low budget, kind of scuzzy and uh, something blows up. Like there, there is a certain bar that we have attached to Euro crime films. So when I say that this is actually a nifty car chase, I'm saying that it is actually well shot, well staged, uh, interesting orchestration. It's a legitimately yeah great scene in this otherwise kind of B film crime, crime movie. It totally exceeded any expectations I had when I put on a movie that I thought was just called big guns. Although I feel like he's not an actor. I know a lot about, but I know enough about Alain Dallon that I wouldn't call like even, even the movies that I know are that are actually full on exploitation. I was just like, the very fact that he is in them makes them, like, sort of not exploitation. Well, let's talk about another Duchu Tassari classic, his Zorro adaptation, which also stars Alain Delon and, as Zorro. And uh, it should just be straight garbage. It's just such a stupid but incredibly fun movie. Uh, I... It's another one that I threw up. Maybe it's this Duchu Tassari thing. Uh, I've seen. I, I have expectations, and when when it's not when it's exceeded, I'm like, holy shit, that was a tremendous experience. Not one I was expecting, and I had such a great time with Zorro. I went out and bought the Blu-ray of the thing. I mean, looking at uh, Tassari's filmography itself is sort of. I mean, he's a genre director, and yeah. he has a pattern of elevating. A genre, despite the film still being very much beholden of that to, genre. yeah, yeah, it's it's B movie and and it's it's genre roots. So, um, the Bloodstained Butterfly, which is another is, is Jalo adjacent. I mean, it could be considered Jalo. Um, another movie that I'm quite fond of, um, Pistol for Ringo, Return of Ringo, and uh, I should mention he also did one of my favorite spy spoofs in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Uh, and I had totally forgotten about that um, until I was looking looking over his filmography again today. So I think it's a it's a matter of the reputation of Duccio Cesari as a secondary Italian genre filmmaker, and not giving him the credit that he deserves, even though he was never given the projects that would have elevated him to uh, any other status. I would actually say uh, this would have been one of the movies that I watched because I would watch a movie. It's like, is that all going on the list? Was that not going on the list? And then eventually I got to like five and then I watched the movie that became six on the list. And the movie that I was going to watch after that was this. But because because I was like, well, I already got my six and I've got other movie homework I have to do. I'm going to stop now, but now now that you're talking about it, I'm definitely going to have to give it a look. Yeah, I had I had tacked this out at the end because it was it was one I knew I I needed to to fit in somehow, and it it may have been I think it was one of the last couple that I added on to watch for the 73 episode, and I'm glad I did. Yeah, but it feels like a movie that's on Tubi. Yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent on Tubi. To, the only reason to be exists is for movies like this. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like I'll have to take care of your Sicilian myself. I'll buy you a nice black dress for the funeral. I'm going to go with uh, something that I feel like is sort of kind of thematically uh, akin to uh, Serpico, but in the almost exact opposite direction. Uh, and that is, uh, it's a movie written by Donald Westlake and directed by Aram Avakian called Cops and Robbers. These two men are New York City police officers. They earn $43 a day, risking their lives as cops. Hold it! 
today, they'll earn $10 million, risking their lives as robbers. What is this? Which is a low-key but often hilarious look at like middle-class burnout and dissatisfaction as experienced by two NYC cops who who've decided that their contribution to society isn't being matched by the the paychecks that they're getting uh, getting you know basically for being you know the, this sort of authority. It it opens up in a way that I really found interesting. Like it, we watch through this large picture window of a, a New York City uh, liquor store, and we see a man dressed in a cop uniform, and he pulls out his gun and casually tells the employees to give him the contents of their till and and like through the window we can see like they can't believe like what the fuck is happening is, is this guy actually a cop like is a cop robbing us right now and it's just it's it's a, it's, a, it's played in such a low key and just sort of like quiet way that that it actually makes it funnier than if they actually like brought us into the uh the the actual liquor store we saw it happening and was hearing what was being said uh, and then, and then the next day, we join like the daily morning commute that uh, the that this cop has ma- makes with his friend Tom uh, and Joe, who's played by Joseph Bologna. He he confesses that he committed the, this robbery, and even though Tom, who is, who's played by Cliff Gorman, is also a cop, he he isn't really like outraged or what did what do you like? He was he's more just like surprised, like really you did that. Later on, Tom, who's a detective, he finds himself like in this home of this very wealthy burglary victim, and he's sort of, you know, distracted by the opulence of her everyday life, and it seems it's so at odds with his own, and that's what sort of what inspires him. Like, well, you know, if you can rob a liquor store, then we can like commit like you know a major heist. Like, well, why not like exploit the fact that we are these authority figures and just use that as sort of the gimmick that you know gets us you know this payday. You know what you told George last week that we could get anything we want only we control ourselves. Yeah. Well, what the hell? Why don't we? Why don't we what? Pull off a job. I bet with all we know, we never get caught. You mean like my liquor store? I mean a big job. A supermarket? No, like a bank or a loan company. You ever think about doing something like that? Their the sort of plan is is that Tom disguises himself in a wig and a bad suit, and he just and he he uh, reaches out to uh, like a really top guy in like a local crime family, and they'll tell him that if they just tell them of a job he can do, like then like he'll do it for two million dollars. And the guy says, you know, well, basically for you know if if I can get ten million dollars, like I, I'd be willing to give you two million of that. And so, you know, the the mob guy is, like, dubious and thinks there's amateurs, but also thinks, like, like I, I won't have to do anything if they end up getting arrested or killed. It won't be attached to me. So why why not just, you know, give it a chance? So he ends up giving them a, 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 hit, a tip about a wealth, a Wall Street brokerage firm that has these, like, vault filled with, un, what, like, the every movie's favorite device, untraceable bearer bonds. Uh, and then, so it predates Die Hard in, in that uh, in, in that aspect. And they quickly, like, they spend maybe five minutes casing the joint, and they figure like the best way to do it is just arrive uh, in uniform while there's uh, a, one of those old fashioned ticker tape parades where people threw paper out of windows while you know the parade was happening on the street. Uh, and they just like come up to the security guard and tell him like, oh, we have a report that someone threw something really heavy and dangerous out of one of the windows. We have to investigate it. So they, they let them in past like sort of the key security doors. And then they sort of managed to get their hands on the bonds. But then there's a twist and they realize that, you know, they're not going to be able to get the bonds out of the out of the building. So they improvise. Uh, and then the, the cops arrive just before they manage to get out of the secured area. And then from there, the film follows Tom uh, and Joe as they try to figure out a way to get the money the mobster promised him, even though they don't actually have the bonds that they were supposed to to rob. I just thought it was a really smart, 
funny film that manages to feel true to life while also playing like sort of a broad farce. It, it, it struck me kind of like as an American homage to Jean Renoir, who I think had a this masterful ability to play with both the mundanity and absurdity of real life in a way that sort of equally highlighted and accentuated both at the same time. And, and sort of what makes this balance of tones feel so special here is you can never quite spot how Avakian is like pulling it off. He makes it sort of feel like effortless, even as you appreciate like how difficult what he's doing. Like the film ends up feeling both like broad and nuanced, vulgar and delicate, cynical and optimistic all at the same time. And you just, I just, I found myself going like, how the fuck do you even do that? Like, like because it's not just the music, and like it's not just like like how do these elements all come together, and how do you decide like to make it happen in a way that genuinely feels like it wasn't an accident, but just also feels like like there's no way to pre-plan it. Like I, it felt very like sort of special in that way. Like my my favorite example of this is in the high sequence, uh, he and he includes some very quick wordless shots between the president of the brokerage and his secretary who are like the only people on the floor who know the robbery is happening and rather than sort of like feel like highlighted and sort of like you know pay pay attention to this is really important it just it seems like this little extra character detail that they you know added for whatever reason and then like it literally turns out that the that this was the indication that the two of them had a relationship that plays into the inspiration for for Tom and Joe to decide to still try to get the money even though they didn't actually get the bearer bonds and it's sort of like it's it turns out it was actually really important to the plot but also you could have watched the movie and figured out what happened even if you didn't notice it so i really like they didn't use explicit dialogue or sort of like like something that sort of made it like the focus. It was just something that just sort of like either you saw it or you didn't. And if you saw it, you really appreciated it more when you found out why it was important. Or if you missed it, then you were like, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that was happening between those two characters. And, and I think that's something I liked about Cobbs and Robbers is that it's a small film with big stakes that manages to never allow the stakes to overwhelm the focus of the characters. And, and, but also doesn't like sort of, you know, glide past the potential consequences of their actions. It's not one of those films where, like, they do something and you're, like, one of those, and at the credits you're like, yeah, but now they're dead. Like, there's, like, no way their life is going to continue on afterwards. The film, like, does recognize if things don't go right for them, they will be killed. And I think that's make Final Shot that, that hit that much harder because even though they got away with the money, someone still had to pay for their crime and it just happened to be someone who really deserved it, and so there's sort of an irony to that that ending that I really that I really loved. Yeah, I just I just absolutely love this this movie. It's uh, one that it, there's a Kino Lober Blu-ray of it, and I think if you get your hands on it, you should really watch it and check it out. The funniest part about this for me is listening to you talk about it in the Shamely Awards in every category. Yeah. I'm like, oh, this sounds interesting. Huh? I haven't heard of this movie. Huh? That's that's nice. And I was just rifling through my sea shelf because when I uh, I will uh, pick a different letter and just plop down and grab something I haven't seen. And in the C section, there's cops and robbers just sitting there <laughs> on my shelf. <laughs> I've got it. It's unopened. It's right there. So... I did threaten to watch it and make it and make it my uh, wild card. <laughs> <laughs> I told him bad things would happen if he did that. <laughs> he was very convincing too. I really <laughs> believed him. <laughs> if you don't know Avakian, uh, probably he's best known for Eleven Harrow House, which is my pick for most underrated movie of the 1970s. Having watched both of them now, it's sort of I feel really bad that he never really sort of after 11 hour house sort of flopped he never really got to make anything like uh, like that again and uh, i i think it's a feel shame i think he was genuinely a really gifted director when are we getting that 11 harrow house blu-ray what the hell's with that yeah well, i would give yeah. 
Yeah, that's that's <laughs> after after Little Darlings, which I don't I don't know if I mentioned that in any other episode, but that was that's the happiest any Blu-ray announcement have ever <laughs> has ever made me. I literally like, the fastest pre-order I ever made. I literally went to the site, saw Little Darlings, clicked on it, and clicked on pre-order. Like I didn't even look down to see if it was the correct Little Darlings. I was just like, if this is if this has the possibility that this is the movie that basically you know. You know, made Christy McNichol my all-time movie crush, then I am going to purchase right now. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know where where uh, who would pick that up. Yeah. That's uh... that's what I'm saying. They should do it. That should be their next one. They should make me equally happy because like 11 Hour House Blu-ray would make me... Or 4K. Make it an 11 Hour House 4K. I feel like it's an imprint... Yeah, that would be my my guess. Yeah, if, if 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 I had to put money on any specific distributor, I'm going with Imprint, which is fair because it is you know a very British feeling movie. Which is you know the fact that Va- Avakian, the movie he made for for that, is a very New York feeling movie, and then he makes that makes Eleven Hero House, which has a very different vibe. If we just keep saying Eleven Hero House, yeah. <laughs> We can will it into existence, so well, I don't and, have to rely and, on and, my. If you're listening to this and you haven't watched Eleven Harrow House, watch it, and then tell like boutique Blu-ray companies, hey, anybody you that'll do listen, Blue Eleven, Eleven Harrow House, yeah. There is an HD master of it out there. It, it, I have yeah. the digital. Uh, it exists. Can we just get a proper disc, please? That was good. Yeah. I think I think it helps when we like the movies we're talking about. It does. <laughs> it really it really does. <laughs> Are you satisfied? Did you like that? If you did, give us a great review on Apple Podcasts or any podcasting platform of your choice. Drop us a message on Twitter at Cinemashame or Blue Sky on Instagram at Cinemashame Podcast. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you on the next episode of the Cinemashame Podcast.